India currently finds itself in a precarious geopolitical position. On the one side, it's been locked in a decades-long stalemate with Pakistan, the two nuclear powers facing off over the disputed border region of Kashmir. Further to the east, there are larger concerns that an ascendant China is flexing its might. And then there have been clashes between Indian and Chinese soldiers along the contested border on several occasions, especially in the Ladakh region. In the face of these threats, the Indian military finds itself woefully outdated in terms of equipment and doctrine and command structure. To remedy these shortcomings, the Indian government is embarking on a large-scale overhaul of the armed forces, hoping that the reforms will be enough to counter any future threats. Amid this call for reform was the replacement for General Manoj Mukand Naravain with Lieutenant General Manoj Pandey as the Indian Army Chief of Staff. This appointment represents a major shift from previous leadership. Before, the Chiefs of Staff could come from branches of service such as infantry, armored corps, or artillery commands. General Pandey is the first Indian Chief of Staff who rose to the ranks as an engineer. The reason for this unusual appointment is due to changes in thinking among the political leadership of India. Previously, the top spot in Indian military would be given to the most senior officer at the time, regardless of any other consideration. Now, this policy seems to be given the top spots based on what's been described as strategic leadership capabilities. This means that the most qualified for upper echelon commands combine the ability to think in terms of combat, such as anticipating and responding to enemy action, as well as improvising solutions in the chaos of an open, full-scale conflict. In terms of politics, or coordinating efforts between civilian and military institutions, as well as work effectively alongside allies. And in terms of institutions, or management of a complex system as the Indian military, the second largest in the world, by the way, this strategic leadership, according to the new school of thought, must be kept separate from tactical leadership, such as the ability to command troops on the ground or organize supply convoys, something that's best left to the battalion or regimental level. It is believed that it is more important to appoint leaders who possess these qualities rather than rely on mere seniority or length of service. In addition to the change in policy, there's also talk about reorganizing the entire command structure of India's military, streamlining it into what has been dubbed theaterization. Currently, the Indian military is divided into 19 separate commands, several different ones for army, air force, and naval elements, with two joint commands which combine elements from all of the branches of service. Each one of these commands is independent from one another, making coordination between them very difficult and administration cumbersome. This complex system also makes combined arms difficult, as each command represents a different branch of service. Ground forces are kept separate from air forces, which are kept separate from naval elements. The proposed theaterization would divide the military into five theaters, the Northern Command, the Western Command, the Peninsular Command, and the Separate Air Defense Command, and also a specialized command that protects Indian waterways and islands. Each command will have army, air, and naval contingents attached, meaning the process of mobilizing forces will be much more streamlined than the current system, where units from different branches of service would have to be pulled from each separate command. One of the driving forces behind this change is the theaterization of China's military, a nation that India is likely to come into conflict with. The biggest challenge India has, however, is upgrading its military hardware. Like any other profession, a soldier needs the right tools for the job. And this is something that's been lacking in the Indian military. Much of its equipment, from humble rifles used by the infantry up to multi-million dollar fighter jets, are outdated, in disrepair, and in desperate need of an upgrade. To this end, the Indian government is embarking on a massive project to update the military equipment that it has. With a total of 93 projects worth $18.7 billion in investment aimed at overhauling these armed forces. These upgrades include drones for surveillance, early warning and detection systems, night fighting capabilities, long-range missiles, cyber warfare, in addition to updates to fighter jets and artillery and rifles used by its forces. One of the first and most pressing areas in need of upgrades is fighter jets. Currently, India is the world's largest user of the Soviet-made MiG-21. Although simple to operate and popular amongst pilots, the MiG-21 is woefully outdated. The first flight of the aircraft occurred in 1955 with India purchasing them for the first time in 1961. Something that old is gonna have difficulty competing with newer and more capable designs. The other major issue is safety. Since 1970, there have been over 170 pilots killed in crashes, including five in 2021 alone. The major factor being faulty maintenance and poor quality replacement parts. Due to these reasons, the MiG-21 is slowly being phased out, with some other variants already retired. 
and the more modern French-built Dassault Rafale taking their place. Artillery is also being upgraded with multiple weapons platforms, including purchasing 145 M777 ultralight howitzers from the United States. These 155mm artillery pieces can fire conventional shells, but also the new XM982 Excalibur GPS guided shells as well, which has a longer range and, if you couldn't tell by the name, is more accurate. In light of recent tensions with China, the Indian Ministry of Defense authorized the purchase of additional Excalibur shells, as well as fast-tracking the delivery of the artillery itself. India has also taken of the role of manufacturing its own artillery, specifically the K-9 Vajra self-propelled howitzer. Indian arms manufacturer Larsen and Tobro began making the guns starting in 2017, using technology that was given to them by the South Korean Hanwha Corporation. The Indian military is also looking into ways to utilize the K-9 to update its tank force. Currently, India uses Russian-built T-72 and T-90 tanks, which are suited for the mountainous terrain of the Ladakh region, where a conflict with China seems more and more inevitable. There are hopes that the chassis of the K-9 can be outfitted with a turret, and the 155mm howitzer can be replaced with either a 105 or 120mm cannon. This will reduce the weight of the vehicle, making a lighter tank that can operate in the rugged landscape of the Himalayas, giving India a more modernized tank force. Even the rifles used by India's infantry are undergoing an overhaul. For decades, troops have been armed with a variant of the INSAS, Indian Small Arms System, a weapons platform that uses a 5.56 cartridge and can be configured as a carbine, assault rifle, or light machine gun. This Indian-made weapon is being replaced by the Russian-built AK-203, one of the newest variants of the very famous AK-47. Chambered in 7.62mm, over 70,000 of these rifles have already been delivered by Russia to India in early in 2022. The remainder of the rifles, between 600 and 700,000, will be produced locally as a joint venture between the two nations. This is after a lengthy negotiation between Russia and India, which resulted in Russia giving up the royalties for each firearm produced, but receiving payments for the technology transfer. There's also concerns over potential Chinese aggression in the Indian Ocean, especially since China possesses the world's largest navy with over 350 vessels. Efforts to upgrade India's naval capabilities began almost a decade ago, starting with the commissioning of the INS Vikrant, the nation's first aircraft carrier in 2013, with plans made for the construction of a second carrier, the INS Vishal. There's also over 40 other ships under construction, including submarines, destroyers, frigates, corvettes. Many of these ships will be deployed in an anti-submarine capacity, given the Chinese Navy's emphasis on nuclear submarines. The Navy is also going to expand the number of aircraft that it deploys, as well as a support craft, such as supply ships, tugboats, and minesweepers. One recurring theme is indigenization, or returning of weapons manufactured to India itself. Currently, India stands behind Saudi Arabia as the world's largest arms importer, Russia being its largest supplier, with the United States and Israel following closely behind. However, with the inherent vulnerabilities of relying on another power for military equipment, compounded by the slowing imports due to the recent pandemic, it was decided that as much manufacturing capacity would return to India as possible. Imports are going to continue as needed, as with the M777 howitzers from America, but factories are being set up to create a domestic arms supply, one that's less vulnerable to international pressures. It's hoped by that 2025, India is going to be a net exporter of arms rather than an importer. Despite these planned changes to the Indian military, many feel that these upgrades are too small. The $18.7 billion earmarked for the refurbishment of the military might seem like a lot of money, but when it's spread over so many projects, each one isn't going to receive that much funding. For example, the proposed shift in fighter craft from MIG-21 to Rafale is slow going, as there is there's not enough money to replace older jets, or at least all of them, or enough of them. There's also some experts who believe that the emphasis on military hardware is misplaced. While weapons and vehicles are obviously important, there's a woeful lack of emphasis on cyber warfare. As technology plays an increasingly vital role in armed conflict, measures must be taken to protect these systems. In any potential conflict with China, the Indian military doesn't seem capable of defending against cyber attacks. Fatal shortcomings as compared to the Chinese People's Liberation Army are probably in the spheres of cyber warfare and impenetrable strategic and battlefield communication systems, where the deficiencies are, if anything, widening, stated one official. There are fears that Chinese forces can hack into or disrupt communication systems, causing havoc among Indian forces, well before the outbreak of fighting. Some believe that this should be the priority, and the new chief of staff, General Pandey, seems to agree. In a recent speech, he stated that the future preparedness must be for gray zone conflicts, which is a vague term, but generally it means conflict between two nations that doesn't involve guns or missiles, but rather misinformation, economic warfare, cyber attacks, or other more covert methods of subterfuge. It's not anything new that we're dealing with here, but with a world that's more and more reliant on technology, conflict is going to spread to the internet and other electronic space systems resulting in yet another front on which fighting could occur. 
However, the new leadership seems aware of the potential threat and is focused on shoring up the weaknesses in that area. Ultimately, as the two most populous nations square off against each other, the question might come down to economics. In 2020, India's total defense budget was around $73 billion, whereas the Chinese defense budget stood at $178 billion. And despite the recent influx of funding, many feel that the efforts are just too small to make a difference. Also, many of the proposed reforms will take years, if not decades, to fully implement making the reforms too little, too late. Though there are tensions along the border between the nations, most of China's attention seems to be focused on Taiwan and strengthening control over the South China Sea, giving India time to prepare against a future conflict. But as always, the future remains unknown. It is hoped, however, that should conflict become inevitable, the armed forces of India would be ready with the most modern tools and methods available. We thank you for watching. Please support the channel by hitting that like and subscribe button. And yeah, we'll see you all next time. Later.